can see that you are moving among the nations. And we just want to declare and agree with you tonight, Father God, that there is something happening across this land. going to strike the heart of every believer in this land. It'll turn the complacent back to you, oh God. It'll put a fire in the heart of every youngster. <laughs> so we declare in America tonight that there is a season that's coming upon us that'll be marked with supernatural hunger, that'll be marked with supernatural desire to draw close to the things of our God, that the Holy Spirit will draw us to the deep things of the Father, that this nation will rise up and say no to the status quo, will say yes to the deep things of our God, and we will be stirred with great compassion for the lost. We will be stirred with great compassion for the homeless. We will be stirred with great compassion with a hatred for sin and a hatred for compromise. In our nation, the United States of America, hear this proclamation tonight that the children of God will be not marked with a divorce rate equal to that of the world, that the children of God will rise up and grab hold of the tools that we have been given, tools of righteousness, tools of glory, tools of power, and tools of might. For we can see that, God, you're moving a mighty river through the nation. The young and old will turn to Jesus and the gates of your kingdom will not be held back. But this is a season of desperation because there is only one God, only one King that our nation can serve. And every idol that have raised itself up and everything that is trying to go higher than the name of our Lord will come down in the name of Jesus, will fall in the name of Jesus, will be destroyed by the power that's in the name of Jesus. Mark us, O oh God, as a generation that is burned with your kiss. Mark us, O oh God, as a mighty people full of your glory, full of your passion, full of your revelation. We don't want to miss what you're doing in this land, oh God. In your glory, in your 
glory in your glory for your America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. <laughs> Let freedom in your church. Let freedom in your church be a reality. Let all the cold people in the church come alive with the white hot glory of God. Let them sing new songs. Let them dance new dances. Freedom and liberty reign across this land for every believer. We see.
let's lift our hands right now and just say a prayer for our country. Right now, lift it up to him. Pray that the Lord would pour his glory out over this land. That the idols of greed and lust would fall. As church after church after church lifts high the name of the Lord. And the mighty rivers that flow from the throne would change us. stay for about two or three more minutes there's anointing here there's an agreement in the house there's a spirit of unity that's here I don't want to miss this moment I love to dance before the Lord and sing and get crazy <laughs> it might be my day I just don't know but I, I just feel such a urging to press in and for us to just lift our voices and pray for our nation right now. I just think of the church after church after church after church after church who's hungry for God. <laughs> and a lot of them just don't know what to do. And here we are in this rich environment. I know there are many of you who are going to go out there and you're going to light up cities. You're going to light up nations. You're going to light up people groups with the glory of God that's rested on you. But our nation needs an explosion of power. And I believe it's happening. I believe there's a hunger. There's a hunger that's rising up. So I want to take this minute right now and just pray, zero in on something in our nation. And I know our concerns are other nations too, but right now I just feel like we should pray for our nation. Pray for the schools, pray for the leaders, pray for our, our governmental officials. Pray for those churches after churches after churches after churches that they would have breakthrough, that the supernatural would explode in the middle of their services.
So church, I'm calling you to pray. I'm calling you to stand in the gap for our nation, for our brothers and sisters. That worship services will not just be stale musical events. But Father God, that you would enthrone our worship and enthrone our praise. That's it, church. Just lift your voice. Don't look around. This is not a time to be a spectator. Let's not miss this opportunity.
Everything Satan means for evil gets twisted around for good. I don't believe the call of DC would have happened. I don't believe there would be an increasing holy militancy among young people if not for Columbine last year and the massacre at Wedgwood Baptist last year. Yesterday, that Wednesday night, is the one year anniversary to the Wednesday of the massacre at Wedgwood Baptist. I believe since the Supreme Court made its most recent unjust rulings, both in terms of partial birth abortions, the bans being overthrown in 31 states, and then outlawing student-initiated voluntary prayer in schools, it seems to me that there are more people praying and crying out than we've seen before. Amen? And even if some of it is people who don't even know God just praying, there, there's, there's an there's a consciousness coming there's there's a realization coming the people are realizing that that God's out of the picture beginning to turn back Rowan how, how many young people were gathered yesterday roughly do we know maybe 2,500 maybe 3,000 we don't know exactly gathering at schools here in the morning yesterday just praying going after God in a rally last night we just, we're getting our, our finger on the pulse of things happening all over. Something's ready to rise. Something's ready to rise. We're going to do two things. And uh, Katie, why don't you just come up here. We're going we're gonna to pray for the things that God's doing in the hearts of young people, parents, and leaders, and people of every walk. The things that God's stirring, that God will push them further. That it will go over that breaking point. You see... Last year, it was a memorable service when we announced the killings at Wedgwood Baptist because first the weeping and the intercession broke out. And the pain for the families and the, the shock of it and the, the, the shame of being an American. But then as, as that moved on, the next thing that began to rise, you could see it in front of your eyes, was a, a holy militancy. Young people in particular saying, devil, you've gone too far. You think bullets are going to make us quiet? Bullets are going to make us bolder. You think threats are going to silence us? It's going to wake us up to the urgency of the hour. Yes. And we'll look death in the face and say we're not afraid. We just got word from um, one of our students whose sister goes to North Central University in Minnesota that there are as many as 10,000 
witches that are gathering on building tops in Minnesota in a, in a few minutes to uh, speak curses and to curse North Central among other places. So uh, just in a few minutes after Katie prays, and, and I want you to all join your hearts together, okay? There is a time to cry out. And there's a time to, to be quiet. This is a time to cry out. Then after that, Mr. Gladstone's going to come, and we're going to bless those that are cursing and, and call down the blessing of God on everything that they're speaking against and, and ask God to turn every curse into a blessing. Amen? But let's lift your voices for what God's doing. Let's join our hearts together in a concerted way. God Almighty, bring it to birth. Bring it to birth. You started the process. Bring it to birth. Bring it to birth. Bring it to birth. Bring it to birth, revolution, a spiritual moral revolution, awakening in your people, awakening on the streets, in the schools, in the public squares, may the light go on in the courts, in the houses of justice, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Father, there's something so significant you want to do in this day and in this hour, Lord God. And I pray that you would just begin to put that vision in the hearts of your people. Yes. Lord, that you begin to stir something up inside of them they've never felt before, God. A passion for you. A hunger for you they've never had, Jesus. Lord, consume us with your purposes in our generation, God. Lord, may we let the things of this world that don't matter to you, may we let them to the wayside, God. May we throw down the idols of this world, Lord. God, help us to take up our crosses, God, and to follow where you're going, because we want to be where you are, Lord. We want to go where you're going in this generation. Put that passion in our hearts, God. May not one of us fall to the wayside, God. May we not become distracted, but may we press in, God, and press after you with intensity and hunger, Lord God. May Jesus be lifted up big in our vision. May he be lifted up big in our vision. May we see Jesus like we've never seen him before. That's what we need is to see you, to see you, God. Because when we see you, our hearts are captivated. Jesus, take us deeper and make this thing real in us. Thank you, Lord. It's time to pray, guys. Just a few minutes into the service as we were worshiping, I got the distinct impression that there was witchcraft trying to come against what we were doing, and just a sense of that in the air. I wasn't spooked by that. That doesn't bother me. In fact, it kind of gets me a little bit excited. But I didn't, I didn't want to say anything about it because I thought it kind of sounded weird. I'd just pray about it. And then Dr. Brown handed me the prayer request about these witches that are going to pray against North Central University. And I realized that God was in this. Listen, friends, the witches and the warlocks and the occult people have been praying against the enterprises of God for a while now. It's about time we start to pray seriously. But the prayers of 850 false prophets, witches and warlocks, they're not even worth a small spark of what one prophet of God can do when he prays. And look at how many prophets of God we have in this place, in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for those who are praying against North Central University. Bless our human enemies. Bless our human enemies, oh God. Bless them. Have mercy on their souls. Give them the light of the law in their hearts, oh God. Turn every curse into a blessing the way you did for Balaam. Let what they speak come out of their mouth a blessing for North Central University, for Dr. Anderson, for the leaders, the staff, the faculty, the students. Blessing, blessing, blessing. We bless North Central. We wish them all the favor of Almighty God. We wish them financial miracles, fresh anointing, wisdom and revelation. And Father, we pray that you will put a fresh passion in your church to pray and to seek your face. God, we need 
Jesus, you living Father, we cry out to you for mercy and grace. We cry out to you for power. Oh God, oh we choke a day. Friends, it's such a joy to labor in love when victory is certain. It is such a joy to labor in love when victory is certain. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Jesus. One more thing we're going to pray for right now. And then we'll shout in victory when we're done because victory is certain. Jesus is risen. The lamb who is slain is the lion of Judah who overcomes. Some of our grads right now are going from Ivory Coast in Africa over to Sierra Leone. The particular journey is, is uh, not all that safe. They just need general protection in the midst of it. But part of their outreach is, is going to be a unique and agonizing thing to be in the midst of. I don't know if you know of some of the, the violence that's, that's happened intertribal and intranation, but in some of the places it's just mass amputation. They'll just go into a place, take all the men, just chop the hands off, and, and uh, just commonly done. All over Rwanda it's been done. And uh, One of the places they're going to be ministering is in one of the amputee camps. And this is us going. This is our own flesh and blood, our people going out there. And, and what an opportunity for the grace of God and the mercy of God to be made known to these hurting, dying people. We have no conception of the need that they're living in day and night and the fear. And, and this is our opportunity to stretch out a hand with them for protection for our grads and the other missionaries that they're working with over there and for God's hand of mercy to have a harvest, those who come to the end of hope in this world, that they'll find hope in Jesus. Amen. So, John, lead us in prayer. Anything else that's on your heart? Let's just join our hearts together. Father, we lift up John Lee and Lauren Kennedy yes. and the team going into Sierra Leone right now. Father, as they go through areas of guerrilla armies and different types of, Lord, criminals and the wicked, Lord God. Lord, let your angels and your power be upon them. Lord, as they preach the gospel to those who've been ripped off by the devil, as they bring the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord, to those who are, Lord, victims of war, God, save the souls of men and women. Lord, bring life. Lord, bring miracles. Lord, bring even renew new arms, new legs. Lord, restore the hands. Lord, re do your signs and wonders. Lord, let them see the power of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for a breakthrough. Lord God, in these places where the devil has been reigning with principalities and powers, and Lord, the people have been killing one another, Lord, without the knowledge of Christ. Lord, send the gospel! Send the gospel! Send the gospel! Yes. And Lord, as you're doing, Lord, as you send one of our own, Lord, send more of us. Lord, let us go out as brands of fire. Lord, here we are. Send us to the nation. Send us to the lost. Lord, send us, Lord, to the hard places. Lord, send us where the enemy thinks he rules so we can declare the kingdom of God. Jesus rules. Jesus is Lord. Keep going after God. Not quite done. Keep going after God. Jesus. Jesus. Lord Jesus. I want one of the leaders from our local outreach just to get up on the platform quickly to lead us in prayer for the hundreds and hundreds that are hearing the gospel on the streets of the city. For those that are hard, for those that are dead in traditional religion, and don't know God, for those bound by sin. Jesus, Jesus, any of the leaders from the local outreach, just come on up and lead us. Master, Master, yeah, sure. Jesus, 
Bless you, Master. Bless you, Master. Bless you, Master. Mighty God. Father, you promised us this city, Lord. Lord, you promised us this city. And so, God, we lay hold of your promise tonight in this place. And we ask that tonight, not only in this church, but all over this city, that your glory would fall. Lord, we pray for the other churches in this city. We pray for the streets, Father. I pray for encounters in the nightclubs, Lord. I pray for the pimps and the pushers, for the prostitutes. Jesus, I pray for the Satanists, for the witches and the warlocks. Lord, let them live an encounter with your love. Jesus, Lord, I pray for every student that goes out on these streets that you decrypt them with the presence and the glory of God, with the gifts of your spirit. Lord, let your presence go with us. Father, come down. Yes. You promised us this city, Jesus. Lord, we're asking for a harvest of souls like we've never seen before. Lord, we're asking for souls. Give us souls. Give us souls. Give us souls. Give us souls. Jesus, give us babes. Lord, I pray. I pray, Father God, for every leader that goes out on the street, that there be a supernatural wisdom, that there be an anointing of humility and grace and love on this student body. Lord, to bring in a harvest for your name's sake, for your glory. Lord, for your glory. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Just lift your voices, just pray. Whatever's on your heart, lift it up to God right now. God, strengthen all those fasting and seeking your face these 40 days. You order the elections, you order the coming events in our nation for your kingdom purposes, for your kingdom purposes. just sharing with me driving up he had just been sensing heavy attack on different individuals and some ready to quit some just feeling like they're not gonna make it I feel what we need to do though is answer fire with fire yes. and uh, Paul and Silas sang and rejoiced after a severe flogging bound up miserable prison cell that's when they began to rejoice, and that's when the earthquake came, and that's when God set the prisoners free and brought salvation to the jailer and his household. And whatever you're going through, those that are in the midst of an intense battle, instead of just waiting for somebody to pray for you or somebody to minister to you, I believe we need to celebrate the victory of Jesus and take hold of the blessing of God and the promise of God. Why don't you all stand to your feet together? Jesus, Jesus, for those that are visiting and ask what kind of service is this, Thursday night, just trying to go after God and be led by Him, you say, this is not what I'm used to, well, correct, that's why you came here, to have something different, amen, thank you, Jesus, I want you to just take hold of this, our Savior, our King, was mocked, Humiliated, died a criminal's death, hung in naked, shameful agony, a laughingstock of the world. And that very act, the criminal act of mankind against God, nailing the Son of God to the cross, through that very act, salvation has come to the ends of the earth. And our Savior rose from the dead and broke the power of hell, the power of death, the power of Satan, and through him and in him, we completely and absolutely overcome. And this is the victory by which we overcome the world, even our faith. Lord, we declare in your hearing that we do not fear any work of darkness, that we do not cower at any attack of the enemy. 
that discouragement and pain and hardship can come our way and we will rejoice and we will glorify Jesus. He is risen. He is Lord. He reigns. He is the King. Yes! Jesus! Shout His name! Jesus! Jesus!
like David did. When the spirit of the Lord moves upon my heart, I will dance like David
As the musicians and worship team sing this one more time before we change the order of what we're doing, we just want to pray the blessing of God on those that are visiting. We want to ask God to make himself more real in your life and for the smile of heaven to be upon you. If you're visiting, if you're not part of the school of ministry or part of the church family here, and you wouldn't mind someone just grabbing your hand or putting a hand on your shoulder and praying for you, if you're visiting with us, you just raise your hand. And uh, students that are here, just turn around and just grab a hand, put a hand on the shoulder, and just pray the blessing of God on them. Pray that the smile of God would be upon them, that Jesus would be exalted, that he would be their portion. Master, let's try to cover everybody. Look around. If you want to come down from the choir to help, pray for some, that's fine. Let's sing this as a prayer. Be our portion. Touch and bless. Anoint. Grace. More grace. More grace. More grace. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. Be my strength. your name. God can bless in one minute. He can bless in one hour. He can bless in five consecutive services. He's not limited in those ways. You may have come from out of state, or out of the country, and 
now may be wondering, well, is a hurricane coming? Will services be canceled and things like that? Could be, but that doesn't stop God from blessing you. That doesn't stop God from giving you what he brought you here for. Amen? So I just want to do this one thing before we sit down. If you've come from out of the country to be with us this week, from out of the country to be with us this week, would you raise your hands? If you've come from out of the country, all right. Any others? Okay. Balcony. Maybe our foreigners were really led this week. All right. Just make sure. Keep your hands up. And students, let's just get some extra folks to gather around them. And then um, pastor, dear friend of, of Bert Farias, here with 52. Would you folks, the, the group that came together from Tampa, would you guys raise your hand, the, the group together from Tampa? All there. Just, just stand up and kind of squeeze together here, that group, and uh, students, just, just surround these guys too. Let's just pray one more time, in particular for these. Bless you, Jesus. As we're praying, God's going to be speaking to one of our faculty about who's supposed to receive the offering tonight. If they don't hear God, then I'll help them hear God. Blessing, Lord. Blessing, Lord. Blessing Jesus, blessing Lord Jesus. Meet them, fill them, pour out your spirit and touch them. God, give them what they need. You brought them here for a purpose. From Tampa, from the ends of the earth. Yes. Satisfy the longing of their soul. Bring healing, bring deliverance. Fresh anointing, fresh release of your spirit grace grace abundantly poured out something fresh from heaven your will be done in power in their lives your will be done in power in their lives your will be done in power in their lives jesus jesus Jesus, your will be done. Everything you've purposed for each of these lives, bring it to pass. Satisfy the longing of their hearts. May they bear much fruit for your name. May they go back to where they came from, glorifying Jesus, reproducing, multiplying, in purity and power. Bring your blessing, bring your blessing, bring your blessing. Thank you, Lord. You know, there's a passion about this woman when she sings. It kind of stirs me up a little bit anyway. Of course, I live with her. It was pretty heavy here, earlier on in here tonight, wasn't it? Was it? Was it there a heaviness that kind of just moved in and suddenly it moved out? But there was a heaviness. Yeah, I've had this heaviness on me all day long. And when we talk about all this witchcraft business, you know, there's things that happen that we don't understand sometimes in the spirit world. But uh, and one, of the, one of those songs we were singing, I forget what it was, but we were singing about, what was that song, Toby, about we go na 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 to the devil or something like that? <laughs> Well, we're going to do some nan nan to the devil tonight. <laughs> so, tonight, I want to talk about the benefits of the sovereignty of God. That means God's in control. That's why I had her sing that song. The first words of that song is, There's, now is no time for fear. Now is not the time to be fearful. God has given us a command to go forward. We're going to stand up like an army. And an army does not move in fear. They move under orders. They move with authority. They move with might. They move with power. And that's what God has called us here to do. And I'm grateful that I know that in my own life that he's in control of it. 
regardless of what I see, regardless of what I've been through, regardless of, uh, of what uh, we think the devil may try to do or what the government may try to do to us sometimes. But when I look at God being in control, when I read the Bible, I see him in control of individual lives. I see him con in control of you as history makers, those of you who are students at the school. I see you in that role. I see what God wants to do with us, and I see us as revolutionaries and his sovereign hand taking care of us as we, more, as we move toward this, this forward march situation. Now, sovereignty, what does that mean? Sovereignty of God. Sovereignty means above all in authority and power. It means he is above all devils. He is above all sickness, all disease. He is above all principalities and powers. He's above all. That's what sovereignty means. He is above it all. And if he's above it all and he's in charge and he's our father and we're serving him, then we shouldn't have a problem that we can't go on through with. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 139 and we'll jump right in. I only have five points, but I have six pages of notes. I'm a teacher, okay, and, and, you know, my wife always tells me, brother, you're in overload about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when you're going after a message, you know, because I, I can, I'd rather teach than preach. Now, Toby's the preacher, by the way, if you ever want her to preach, I mean, she can preach, but uh, that preach comes on. <laughs> So the first point is this. I find in Psalm 139 that God is sovereign over our individual destiny because he says in verse 1, he says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise and you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise up on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. In verse 13, for you created my innermost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. All my days, or all the days ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. That tells me God knows the beginning from the end of my life. He knows the beginning to the end of your life and what he's called you to do. That tells me that he has plan and he has purpose. He has a reason for you being in this room tonight. He called you to be here in this room tonight for a purpose. And I remember first 23 years of my life when I became conscious of why am I alive? Why am I on this earth? What is my purpose? Do you ever ask God that? Do you ever come along in a part of your life when you say, what am I here for? You know, and I didn't know what I was here for until I met Jesus. Then I found out what I was here for. You know, our schools are full of young people today who ask that question, what am I here for? And they're not getting an answer. That they're not getting the purpose of why they're here. And that's why our schools are full of suicides. They're full of men and, young men and women who are ready to lay their life on the line with a gun to their head because they don't have a plan or a purpose in their life. I was one of those early on. I was one of those who put a rope around my neck and tried to kill myself because I didn't have a purpose in life. I was one of those who wandered aimlessly early in, the early in my early 20s because I had no purpose and plan. But then I find out when I get born again that I can read the Bible and it says, you are, you are created by me. My, you're in my inmost being. You knit me together. You know me. You know my ins and my outs. You know exactly what I'm going to say before I say the very next word. That gives me comfort. That gives me great comfort. And I know that when I say that God knows us, that tells me that he has a plan and a purpose for us. And, and we've been talking about that plan and about that purpose and about revolution and how we're going to move into this nation. But I know that brings some fear on some of you because you've been in my office. You've been saying, what, what's my part? <laughs> what, what am I supposed to do? How, how do I enter into this thing? I mean, 
We're talking revolution. We're talking the power of God. We're talking about taking a nation. We're talking about changing lives. But I'm new here. <laughs> I'm new here. What am I? I've only been saved, six, uh, you know, at least a year in the school before you come now, right? <laughs> I've been only saved a year. What am I supposed to do? Well, if God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and I can tell you this, God will guard that plan for you. He will keep that plan for you. He will protect that plan that he has for you. And he will see to it that it is completed in your lifetime. Now, you may have to go through some things to find out, but I know this. Your part is to simply say yes. Say yes. yes. We're going to say yes to God tonight. Yes. yes. We're going to say yes to your plan and yes to your purpose. Problem is, we don't know what all that plan and purpose, purpose means and how we walk it out. Some of this is kind of uphill. We don't like the uphill. We like the mountaintop and we like the downhill coast. Like that shout when Dr. Brown said, well, school may or may, and may not be tomorrow. And you can come if you want. No, somebody kind of groaned at that one, I think. I know this, God has identified you as carriers. You know, mosquitoes are carriers. But you're also carriers. You're carriers of the gospel. You're carriers of the message that's going to change this generation. The, the key to this thing is that last Saturday night, John Cobb preached a, a powerful message, and he issued a call. And I saw most of you down here on your face answering that call. Now the question is, what's the next step? Where do we go from here? How, how do we continue to move on in this, what God has called us to do? Like you, Isaiah... He also stepped out from the ranks and he became a voice of God to his generation. And now that you have heard this call, you will be this voice to this generation. You are going to be the ones who will be a voice into this generation. Young or old, it makes no difference how old you are. You have a place and you have a call. You know, when I uh, received an email a couple of days ago from our missionaries in Mexico and they'd just been out for two or three days in a place called Michoacan, I think that's right. And they were, I talked to them on the phone today and they were just so excited. We have, we have two, fam, two, four interns and about one, two, three, four full-time BI missionaries in Mexico and they'd been out ministering in this new place. And, and they said, the pastor said, we've had Americans here before. We've had Americans come and preach at our church and they were good, I mean, they were good men. They were, they were powerful preachers. He said, but we've never experienced anything like this before. He said, your team has revolutionized, turned our church around in three days into an area of depth that we've never been before. That says something to me. That says to me, you're carriers. You are carriers by being in this anointing and in this revival. You are carriers. Pastor said, we've had great men here. We've had powerful men. We've had great preaching. They probably, like Steve Alt, took some great big, great offerings, you know, but I don't know. But he said, the Spirit of God came on that pastor, and he spent most of the three days on the floor, and he'd never been out in the Spirit in his life. And our head missionary there, the leader of our base, he looked around and he said, I didn't see Dr. Brown anywhere. I didn't see Bob Gladstorm anywhere. These are the men of God who prayed for them and ministered to them and who released that power and anointing on them. They said, hey, we didn't even see you standing around there either. But God was there. The Spirit of God moved in that church. History makers, world changers, shakers. They're happening. It's happening. It's going to keep happening. David Livingston said this. He said, Lord, send me anywhere. Only go with me. Only go with me. Lay any burden before me. Only sustain me. Sever any ties, but that binds me to your service and to your heart. And I wonder how we feel at times when we are, we're, we're beginning to feel the press that we're going to have to do something with this revolutionary call. What is my part? What am I supposed to do? God has called me. I remember when I received the call 
I assumed to missions, I was only 23 or 24 years old. Arthur Blessed had come to our church in, in North Carolina, and he, had this, he was the man who carried this cross around the world. And he was preaching to a congregation of about 2,000. I was sitting out in the middle. I hadn't been saved too long, but long enough to know that I had a call on my life, but I wasn't sure what. And he began to issue the call at the end of the service. And, he, and I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, that, well, okay, okay, this couple needs to go. Mm -hmm. That couple needs to go. You see, and I, I had about 10 couples that I had already chosen for God to go to the mission field. And as I, in my mind, as I'm listening to this man issue the call to go, and I'm assuming that's why I received my call to missions, was because when I opened my eyes, I'm standing beside Arthur Blessed, standing on that stage, and I open my eyes, and I'm looking at people, about 2,000 of them, and I'm wondering, how in the world did I get here? That's probably the coast closest to being translated I've ever been because I know I didn't stand up and consciously and walk down the aisle. But there I was. I, I, I said, now, now what am I going to do? And in those days, it was the same kind of call to go out, win the loss, change your life, turn your life around, get the drugs and get the needles out of your arms, put the marijuana away, stop doing all the things that you know that, you know, that suddenly, are, you know, oh, this is really wrong, isn't it? You get a wake-up call. Well, many of us in the beginning, you know, may feel like some of, the, some of the men in the Bible, like, for example, Gideon, you know, Gideon received a call from God. And Gideon, when he said, you know, suddenly there's an angel that appeared to him and they said, hey, mighty man of valor. He was over hiding behind the, the press. You know, some of you may feel that way. At least that's the way it sounds when you come to my office some of these last few days, wanting to know what am I supposed to do in this revolution. Well, <laughs> What happens when God calls you to extreme obedience? I mean extreme obedience. And, and Gideon was being called to, I think, I think, a thing of extreme obedience. And he said, the angel appeared to Gideon and he said, Hey, the Lord's with you, mighty warrior. And the Lord, the Lord turned to him and he said, Listen, he said, you go in the strength that you have. You don't have to wait to be pumped up like Schwarzenegger, you know, before you go out. You don't have to be Steve Hill before you go out. You don't have to be Dr. Brown before you go out. You go out in the strength that you have. You go out in the strength that you have. You're going to see some things happen. You're going to see some devils run. You're going to see some dead raised. You're going to see some healing take place. You're going to see lives turned around. If you'll just challenge it a little bit with the strength that you have, you can do these kind of things. I'm telling you, you can. He says, you go out with the strength that you have and you save Israel out of the Midian's hands. He says, am I not sending you? I think he's giving you the same message. Am I not sending you? Am I not going to send you? But Lord, he said, how can I save Israel? I'm the weakest in my clan. I'm the poorest. I'm not educated well. I have problems in my life. I can't overcome the things that's in my life. How can I help others overcome things in their lives? The Lord answered, he said... I'll be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. And when I answered the call to God to go to Malaysia, I said, Dear Lord, how in the world can I do that? He said, I will be with you. And I believed him. You have to believe him also. You must make that conscious decision that it doesn't matter whether you're the poorest, whether you're the weakest, whether you're the most educated. It doesn't matter. Get in it, this doesn't matter. What matters is this, don't dwell on your weakness, but dwell on my strength because I will be with you. Wherever he calls us to be revolutionaries, he says, I'll be with you. I've proven this. I've proven it for myself, so I'm happy and I'm content with it. I'm content to go through some of the hard problems, to, to go to the hard places where nobody else wants to go. I'm content to do that. How about you? You know, sometimes we get in these hard places and we think, well, uh, how, do, how can I stand with such an awful, awesome, powerful enemy that comes against me? Well, he's not so big. We sing that song. <laughs> he's so small. He's so small. <laughs> he really is. He's just big in our own minds. Big in our own minds. See, if God has called you and you have this overwhelming sense of, of, of weakness or I'm not sure... That, you know, am I adequate? Then you just simply rejoice because men throughout history have felt the same way. When they began, they, they, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to students now. I'm talking to those of you who are in the school. You are here for a purpose. You're here for a reason. Some of you are not really sure why. You just know you're supposed to be here. 
Is that how you, you came? God said, come here, right? He said, come, but he didn't, he was like, you were like Abraham. He just said, pack your bag and go to a city. I'll tell you where to go. And then I'll tell you what to do from there on. Well, you're here and he will tell you where to go the next step. This call to be a radical revolutionary to holiness by life or by death may be beginning to sink into you now. It will cost you something. I remember when I sat down across the table from David Kerr, who was the assistant director of Globe Missionary Evangelism in 1984, and I was filling out my application and I was filling out all the papers, and there was a line there, and it was a signature line, and it says, are you willing to lay down your life and die for the gospel of Jesus Christ on a foreign field? I laid the pencil down. I'd never come to that place of that, of that realization that, man, I could die out there. I was going to Islamic country, and I'd been studying on Islam. Those folks will kill you because you're a Christian. They'll hurt you. They'll throw you. At, I mean, and I'm thinking, I, I lay the pen down, I pick it up. I'm thinking about it. I lay the pen down, I pick it up. It was, one, it, was a, it, was a, it was a critical point in my life because I had two daughters, had a wife, and I said, would I, Lord, if I go, and he says, I'll be with you. Sign it. <laughs> yes, sir. So I filled in the blank. But I know this, we all, I think we all had a sense of soberness. Last, was it Saturday night when we prayed, when, you know, we prayed, we talked about the, the bill that had been passed, about these laws that had been uh, brought against us and basically that will come against us in this nation. And it, it had an effect on us. It had an effect on old Bob Gladstone. He got up and he said, you know, I, I, suddenly I see it's going to cost me something. I feel differently now. Something is, is being taken away from me. I feel differently now. Well, it's going to cost us something if we do this. It will cost you something. It may cost you your life. Some of you may feel like Jeremiah when he was called. How many of you feel called? Still. Still feel called. Okay. I know when Jeremiah was called, he says, um, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a child. I don't know what to say for you. He says, you've called me to be a prophet to the nations. I don't know what to say. God's called me to be a revolutionary to the nation. I don't know, quite know what to say. What, Lord, what do I say? Is I'm just a baby in the Lord. And what did he say to, to Jeremiah? He said, you must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Just go and do it. Do not be afraid of them, for I will be with you and I will rescue you. And when I got to this part about being rescued, that tells me he's going to be in trouble. I read Jeremiah simply because, I read that book years ago because it said, I will rescue you. And I thought, from what? <laughs> Man, I need to know about this guy because I've, I've got a feeling I'm going to be in trouble. If I'm going to follow Jesus, if I'm going to hit it hard, then I'm going to make some people angry and they're not going to be happy with me. So I better find out how God rescues me, how he rescued Jeremiah. Because he did not promise him an easy road. But he did promise protection and guidance and rescuing when he needed to be rescued from time to time in his life. He said, Jeremiah, he said, they will fight against you, but you will not, they will not overcome you. For I am with you and I will rescue you. You see, extreme obedience, extreme obedience when God's plan and His perfect will comes into play into our present time, like right now, like today, when that plan becomes activated, then what that does, what that says to me is that it releases something to us, all right? It releases an assurance that His presence and His grace and His power is going to be there to help me get through that situation. Whatever He's called us to do, He's going to help us to do it. And I know this, we've had orders 
You know, orders have come down from the president and have come down from the lawmakers. Other laws will follow. You can count on it. Other laws will follow unless we stand up, even if we do stand up. But even today as in the day of Daniel, so turn your Bibles to Daniel. Let's, let's look at a couple of, a couple of stories here. I, I want you to see something. See, I, I believe that God's in control of our destiny, regardless of what he calls us to do. In Daniel chapter 3, we find some, 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 some men. In verse 1 in chapter 3, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. That's, that's a pretty good size image. 90 feet. That's what, 8 stories, 9 stories tall? I mean, that's 7 stories and... You know, 90 feet, that's, that's pretty good size, you know. Sometimes we may look at the laws that's coming down from our government and from the law of this land, and we may say, well, that's a pretty big law. How are we going to get around this one? Let's, let's be careful. How, we approach, how do we approach this God? How do we approach this law or this image? And there was a pro proclamation that came to these people. And in verse 5, he said, as soon as you hear the the sound of a horn or a flute and all these pipes and all kinds of music. He said, everyone must fall down and worship this image of gold. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Well, there may come a time that if we don't immediately bow to the law of the land, they're going to throw us right into the jail. They'll just throw, or they may throw you right out of the country that you're in. I was always dodging immigrations guys and customs guys and secret service guys over in Southeast Asia because, you know, they knew we were there. I had to register with the police every time we came into town. We'd have to go and register with the police locally. And sometimes they'd come to my house. They'd, they'd knock on my door and come into my house and sit for a while just to see. They'd look around, see what kind of stuff I had. They'd look over my stuff, you know, and, you know, and they'd just take a look and they'd have a seat. And I'm thinking, dear Lord, what do they want? Well, a little later I found out they wanted money because they see the kind of stuff you have and they want your money. Who knows what they want, they may want the next time, but if we didn't play the game, you didn't get the, you didn't get the visa. So how are we going to play the game when we get into some of these countries? I know this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a choice that they had to make. He said that there were some Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Hey, we've got a number one Jew who's kind of over the affairs of revolution around here. I see. But their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they replied to this king, they said, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Because if we're thrown into this blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand. But if he does not, we, will, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've set up. We have to make some decisions. And it says, he ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter. Do you know that I have a feeling that when it comes down to the court time and we have to stand before the judge, that as Christians, we may get sentences five or six times more lengthy than the common criminal? That's what happened to Jimmy Baker. For his crime in comparison to others, what, 45 years or something? In comparison, 45 years? For, I mean, yeah, he committed the crime, but normally you'd only get 10 to 15 years for something like that. So beware. Isn't this, isn't this encouraging? Seven times hotter for some of you. So... Look what happens in the story, though. Let's just follow the story. So he ordered them to be thrown into the furnace. But all of a sudden, in verse 24, it says, The king leaped to his feet in amazement, and he asked his... He said, Hey, did, weren't there three men we tied up and we threw into that furnace? He said, I see four. I see four. One of them looks like the sons of the gods. Well, I want to tell you something. If, if, if you get thrown into that furnace... Seven times hotter. Guess who's going to be in there with you? Guess who's going to be in there fanning on you? 
He says, it's cool in here, and you better get your coat. Because we've got the God who's the God of fire. I mean, if he's in control, he's in control of the heat, too. He's in control. But look what happened when they made a stand. They made a stand. He, they, they said to them, if you don't bow, then you will burn. But they took a stand, and because they took a stand, these three men changed the course of a nation. They changed the course of that hope because there was a proclamation that came that said, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their God's going to be our God. We're going we're to bow down to him. What can we do if there, with a thousand of us in here or eleven hundred of us in this school? What could a thousand, if three can turn a nation, what could a thousand do? Come on, let's, 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 enlighten, let's get our faith levels out here. Let's, let's open up our minds and expand what we can do. Because, you know, sometimes we wonder what, can, what could uh, a couple of hundred thousand or two or three hundred thousand do up in the mall in D.C.? Well, let's see. Let's see what, happens, what happened in the heavenlies. To give it a little time, let's, let's see the progression of what God will do here. Well, I know this. <laughs> you bow here, you're going to burn somewhere else. You come out of this environment and you bow there's going to be an eternity of burning but it's not going to be heavenly burning i don't want to take the chance one power encounter changed the course of a nation turn over a couple of pages to daniel 6 there's another another man of god that we that we look to there was another order given there was another order given you know about praying here we are on prayer they said, you know, we're going to give this order. You can't pray. So Daniel, being the revolutionary that he was, when, when they gave the order, he went and prayed anyway. But the consequences were grave for him because he gave the order and he said, throw him in the lion's den. So they took and they threw him in the pit, put a stone over it, put the king's seal on it. And the king became very nervous and he couldn't sleep that night. He, he paced the floor all night long wondering, wonder, I wonder what Daniel tastes like to those lions. I wonder if Daniel's God. But you know what? You know what I think happened? When Daniel hit the pit, shoo, you know what I think he saw? I think he saw this angel sitting over there with those two big cats. And he says, nice kitty. <laughs> I'm, I don't know. It's just my own imagination. I, I, because God does things with angels. They're powerful, they're strong, they're mighty. But I can just envision when Daniel's feet hit the ground, he saw those lions, but suddenly he, his eyes were open to the spirit world, and there stood this angel saying, nice kitty. Don't worry, Daniel, everything's cool. Well, if, if they throw you in the lion's den, one man changed a godless law. One man, one man. One person can change a godless law if we'll stand up and not be afraid and not be fearful. Now is not the time to fear. Now is the time to stand up, be bold and be strong and take a few hard steps and stand. That's what we have to do. I remember when I was on the fire department in, in North Carolina, uh, we had a code of ethics and a standard that we had to abide by as a firefighter in the city because we had a reputation that we were trying to keep up. And, you know, they, the, the captains and the chiefs, we had all these meetings and they said, there's what you have to do. If you go out and get drunk and, and you get in trouble and things, then we'll demote you. And, and they were trying to uh, upgrade our standard and our, at least our image in the city. So at the same time, cable TV came into play. And the city says uh, to the cable companies, we are going to... Uh, we want to put cable in all of your city and all these things. So the, so the city father said, okay, then you'll have to put cable free in every public building. Every public place where we have men working or whatever, then we need cable for free. So they did this. And little did I realize what this was going to bring into our station. And then after a few weeks, the cable was on, the TV was on. You know, firefighters, we have a lot of time to sit around. If there's not fires going on, they sit around and watch a lot of TV, a lot of ball games. But then I, I, I got up one night and... I was, you know, I went to the refrigerator, get a drink of water, and I, and I walked through, and I saw these guys, and I looked at the TV, and I could not believe what I could, on my eyes, because this was back in the, back in, all oh, the middle 70s, 
when it first came, and I looked, and there was two men rolling around on the floor with each other. And I said, what are you men watching? They said, we've never seen anything like this before on television. So I took the, the little TV guy, and I began to flip through, and I began to see all the filth that they were trying, that they were going to put into our station. Something rose up on the inside of me that said, this is not right. Here they are requiring us to hold a higher standard than this, and then they pipe this into us to watch every day. So I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to the fire chief. You don't mess with the chief too much, you know. I was just a little, little flunky. You, know, you don't mess with the chief. So, but I wrote this letter. See, I was a rebel anyway. I was on the man's blacklist. I'd been a rebel for a number of years there, and, and I wasn't real high up in his place as far as integrity of anything anyway, but he didn't know I'd got saved. He didn't know God changed my life, but I wrote the man a letter. And any time you didn't want any, it, you know, if you wanted the whole department to know what was going on, then you just uh, would leave that letter open on the chief's desk, and he wouldn't file it away anywhere. And when they'd come in and clean at night, uh, naturally, they're going to see everything that's going on. So they read this letter. And the next day, they took, they cut off all the cable to the fire stations. They cut it off. And they said, there'll be an investigation. We'll just wait and see. Well, I took a stand. Now, there was 120 of these men. Needless to say, it didn't take but about 30 minutes for every phone to ring to find out why they cut the cable off. They didn't like me too much anymore. When you stand for righteousness, when you take that stand, people may not like you anymore. They may turn their back on you. And in, in those days, as a firefighter, putting my life in their hands could have been pretty dangerous because we were in some, some dangerous situations. But I know this, one man changed a negative thing throughout a city department because they took a stand. Now, they didn't like it. But you can't tell me to hold one standard here and not hold another standard there that's, that's so far different. How do you expect me to do this and do that at the same time? Well, God's going to call you to do some things. I know this, 12 disciples turned the whole world upside down. What can a thousand of us do? What can we do? Our ultimate destiny, this is point number two, our ultimate destiny cannot be modified by Satan. And you, I know you come to school and you wonder, you know, I hear a lot of this sometimes in my office. And you say, oh, the devil's after me and all these kind of things. But I know this. Uh, in Job chapter 1, turn back to Job. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. Job chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. And, and the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth, back and forth through it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Well, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything that he has is in your hands, but the man himself you do not lay a finger on. I believe that Satan has to have permission to get at us. If there's a hedge about us, if there's a, a, a protection on us, then we should not be fearful about going out and working for the Lord. We shouldn't be fearful about doing these kind of things. The fear of the unknown will stop us. Our imaginations will stop us because we don't know what's out there. There's a fear to be a revolutionary because the revolutionaries can get into trouble. They can be thrown into a pit with lions. They can be thrown into jail for a time. But it's the fear of the unknown, not, not knowing. You see, and when I read this uh, some years ago when I was a young boy, I, I had a paper route. And as I was writing on this paper route, I had to, there was this dog. There's this bulldog, one of these, you know, they were, it was a bad dog. I mean, this was a mean dog. I would get up and I'd take it down the hill and I'd get on my bike and I'd get the pedal in this thing so fast, I'd bring my feet up and sling that paper and I'd just sail right on by. Now, this is a morning time route about 5.30 in the morning. 
That worked well until the end of 30 days. I had to go to the house and collect. I had to have the money for the papers. And I thought, well, the dog's usually out here. I will sneak around and come up the street and go up into the back. Well, that, that afternoon, everything was working really well, but suddenly I realize I'm halfway through the woods and I hear this dog, roo, roo, and here he comes. I mean, he spots it and here he comes. And then he stops and he thought he heard me out there. I went up a tree. I went up this tree. I mean, lickety split, I'm up this tree and I'm hanging on and I'm thinking, oh man, I am up a tree. And there's that dog. I can see the dog and it's, and it's getting dark and I'm up a tree. And I have to finish collecting on my paper route. And 30, 40 minutes goes by, it gets really dark, the lady comes home, the light, back porch light comes on, and I think, man, I'm so glad this woman's home turned the light on for me. So she comes out with the dog, dog food, and she takes the pan, and she takes it out, and she sits just so far, and the dog comes, and he's out running around, and she walks down the driveway, around the side of the house, down the driveway, and, and, and suddenly the dog, he wants to go too, and he takes off, and he's running, and then... <clears throat> The chain that he was tied to. You know, about 30 foot, 30 feet of length of chain. I see that as, as like a picture of, of God and Satan. I think he has him on a big chain. I think he can growl and he can roar and he can bark and he can get us so hemmed in, climb up, climbing up a tree to where we're just kind of stuck in fear. And it, all it is is noise. It's just noise. It's just nothing but fear of the unknown. Well, our ultimate destiny, I, I, I just don't see how Satan can modify that, judging simply by that one scripture in the Bible. The Bible says Job was a righteous man. He, 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 he served God, and, and God took care of him. The key was his righteousness. See, if we run righteously to him, he's going to take care of us just like he did Job. He was a blameless man. He feared God, not the dog. Forget that. You're going to hear the noise. So our ultimate destiny cannot be modified by Satan. And then that leads me to this, that the sovereignty of God increases our trust in him. Because I know that he is above all in power and strength. That gives me comfort. To know that whatever I do for him, any way that I serve him, he's in control. He still is in control. Whether I believe I like the circumstances I'm in or not, he's still in control. Because when we pray, you know, if you don't want God to be in control, you never should pray the Lord's Prayer. Because when you say, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done, and then it don't work out the way you think it should be, then you blame him, then quit praying that prayer that way. Because if he does it his way, it's his way. We may not understand the ways he, he does things all the time, but I'm going to run with him. See, the Holy Spirit is where? He's within us, and he knows what God knows. You see, he already knows what God knows, and I, and I, I take great comfort in that. You see, at the Lord's Supper, I see where Jesus saw that Peter was about to uh, go through some hard times. He, was, he knew he was going to deny him three times. He knew that when he did that, he'd be depressed. He knew that he would have problems, that he'd be discouraged. But in Luke 22, it says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I take great comfort in knowing that Jesus knew what was about to happen, and he was praying for him. Well, I've got good news for you. Guess where Jesus is tonight? He's at the right hand of our Father, and what's he doing for us? I think he's praying about this revolution. He's praying about every, each and every one of us, each and every one of you who are going out and going, you're going to do something for God. You're going to be the history makers. Sooner or later, you'll be some of those history maker makers. You'll be training them up to go out, people to go out and do some things. Peter didn't even know he was under attack, but Jesus did. He didn't know that he had a need for Jesus to pray for him, but Jesus did. I take great comfort in that. See, Jesus knows when we're under attack. He knows when we're going through some things. And I like this, that Satan, I listen, Satan is not in control of my life. He's not in control of my home. He's not in control of our schools. He's not in control, really, of this nation. Now, there's problems there, but he's not in control. God's in control. He's the one that's in control. So who's responsible to guide us? Who is responsible to guide us? In Psalm 32, 8, 
The Bible says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you will go, and I will counsel you, and I will watch over you. I'll look after you. So whose responsibility is it to, to take care of us? It's God's responsibility. He said, I will guide, I will lead, I will instruct. And sometimes, you know, in the future, for many of you, he's going to give you your orders of what you should do. How will you serve him? What's going to be your place, your ministry, your call? How will you fulfill it? And I remember going uh, to prayer, knowing that May was coming, graduation was coming when I graduated from Bible college. I knew that in May something had to give, and I was not willing to hang around for two or three years and wait on some kind of non-existent call. I said, God, I'm going to press in. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast until I hear. And then when I heard what he said, I was wondering, you've got to be kidding me, because he said, I want you to go to Malaysia. I want you to help set up some Bible schools along with the local churches. And I said, hey, I lived on the same street for 30 years. You want me to go to some place? in Southeast Asia. Man, I have a hard time getting back and forth from Walmart, let alone to Malaysia. Come on, help me out here. You're kidding. This can't be right. What am I? Who am I? You see, the question is, you say, who am I to go into a place of Malaysia and start a Bible school? I've never started a Bible school in my life. But I knew that extreme obedience had to kick in. That when he said to do it, then you start packing. So I started packing. I went to my family. We talked about it, you know, and after they kind of got over the initial shock, maybe three months, <laughs> then we were in agreement. Instead of saying, you know, Daddy, we don't, even get a, we don't even get a witness on this. Instead of getting that, they started saying, now when we get to Malaysia, is it going to be like this or like that? Uh, when we get to Malaysia, what are we going to do when we get there? Will it be like this or like that? Well, then I knew God had already turned their hearts around. And I'm thinking, well, you're satisfied now, but what am I going to do when I get there? <laughs> you know, I remember flying out of Pensacola and the words in my heart, you know, I had a big lump in my throat and we'd sold all we had. We had everything in eight suitcases, following the call of God, charging out as the revolutionary in our day. And I remember the, these great words welling up on the inside of me and it was like, my God, my God. <laughs> Why have you forsaken me? <laughs> That's what was inside. We'd taken all the right steps. We, we, were, we, were, we were in God's will. I have no doubt that we were in God's will. But inside, when, you, when, when the plane is going up and, you know, the Pensacola is getting farther and farther away. But when we arrive, you see, it's, it's the things that happen after you get there. When we arrived, we were only there one week. And we went to, we, we trained down all night. Jet lag was terrible on us. It took us three days to get there. But I know this, we were saying, we are in the will of God. We know that we're supposed to be here. We've heard the Lord. Too many confirmation after confirmation was saying we're to be there. And it lined up too perfectly not to be God. So we went, and as we arrived... We spent all night going to uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia on a night train, clickety-clack, clickety-clack, 12 long hours, no sleep. No sleep. You can't sleep on those little trains. The beds are about this wide. And you're trackety-crack down this 12 long... We get there. We, we, the pastor says, I have, I have, we have meetings three times a day. And, and you can barely keep your eyes open. Okay, let's go. So we're preaching, and we preached for three days and a half, three and a half days. And the pastor, we sat down at breakfast one morning. He said, what are you doing here in our country? Why are you here in our country? And I said, the Lord spoke to my heart. He said to come over here and, and start Bible schools alongside of local churches. And, and I began to give him the vision of what I felt like God had told us to do as a family. And um, he said, well, that's interesting. I will pray about it because this man was on the board of, of the Assembly of God uh, major Bible college in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and in Singapore. So this man was one of the high up guys, and we were at his church. And we came in the back door. We didn't come in the front door. Because I was one of those that when they said, well, you can't go over there, I said, why not? Well, this is Islamic. You can't go over there and do that. I said, why not? Well, they'll, they'll do this or they'll do that. I said, so? We're, we, we're, going, we, we're here now. So on the fifth day, to make the cut this down, on the fifth day, the pastor said, uh, I believe that God is telling me that uh, I'd like to invite you to come and work in my church. 
And he said, I want you to start a Bible school. And I'm thinking, uh-oh, start a Bible school. So we're sitting again at his little small breakfast table. He stands up and opens the door. He said, come over here, please, and take a look. He was an Indian man. He opened the door, and here was a, 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 a bedroom that was full of videotapes and books. And there were large um, uh, Sony uh, recorder machines. I mean, these large silver screen machines. There were three of those in there. He said, we had a Bible school closed down. Uh, about 10 hours from here and and they gave us all this equipment. Do you think we could use that as a bi in our Bible school? I'm thinking this will work This is good and I walked up to the walls and I began to read Off the, the labels and the names of these tapes and it said Liberty Bible College Ken Summerall and as I began to go down the list of all these tapes and all these, and he said, do you think you could make me a Bible school out of this? Something inside rose up on the inside and said, oh, yes, we can do this. You see, I just spent five years at Liberty Bible College. I had just finished the last three years of all the tapes in every class. I had every note in two suitcases ready to go. Coincidence? I don't think so. God knows how to guide and get us out there to get the job done for him. Did we start a Bible school? Several. But that's neither here nor I'm just telling you. You will not take this revolution to the world by life or by death by yourself. You won't be by yourself. I'm telling you, you won't be by yourself. So get the fear out. Listen, Moses was not alone. When he took the children out of Egypt, when he stood at the Red Sea, when he held up that staff, he was not alone. Joshua was not alone when he took them on into the promised land. He was not alone. You won't be alone either. Gideon was not alone. He was not alone. Daniel was not alone when that angel was sitting there saying, nice kitty. He was not alone. You will not be alone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God's son jumped into the midst of the fire and they said, let's have a party. So they came out, their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. That's protection. That's power. That's the good stuff. Stephen was not alone when they stoned him for what he believed. They stoned him, but he said, I see heaven open. I don't even think he felt the last rock on his head. But he was not alone. You will not have to face revolution alone. If they throw you in jail, you won't be alone. All five of you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He's back to this jail thing now. Well, listen, other people, other people cannot stop God's destiny for you. No matter what other people may try to do to you. My perfect example of that is Joseph. Joseph God had a plan and a purpose for Joseph. God gave him dreams. Now, his family did not like his dream and vision. They did not like his interpretation of what God said was going to happen in his life. And so his brother sold him into slavery. And then one thing led to another. And how many of you would feel like, oh, I'm in the perfect will of God. I'm all bound up here now. My God, my God. <laughs> What have you done to me? How many of you have ever been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel? I haven't either. But I have friends who have been. I have friends who have been. And you know, every time they went to jail for preaching the gospel, they were not alone. This one guy, he was not alone. Because every time, every time they take him to jail for preaching the gospel, and every time that bailiff would put that Bible out there for him to put, the, put his hand on the swear on, He'd just taken, he just out of the corner of his eye, he'd just turn his head a little bit and he'd begin to smile and he'd look over at the judge and just smile really big at him. Because he knew what he's being charged for was in this book. He knew that he was swearing on and swearing an oath to do something that the, the judge was requiring him to swear on. And not only was he not alone, not only did he not have to spend any time in jail, but they, many times he walked out with money in his pocket for being falsely arrested, for breaking a law. Because here he's breaking God's law, and the judge saw it. 
No, he wasn't breaking God's law. He's breaking man's law. And the judge said, $2,000, give it to him. I'm serious. God, you know, other men may do things to us. Other men may put you in jail. I know this, that God will use man's effort to accomplish his purposes in us. He will use even wicked men's efforts to accomplish his purposes in us. Because in Genesis 50, the bottom line was this. When his brothers came and their family came, Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended for it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many souls. You know, you may wind up in jail just to save a soul. And that is okay. I have lots of stories about, you know, several of these men who've been in jail for preaching the gospel. And one guy, he was, <laughs> he was in solitary. And they had this little window. And he began to do like Paul and Silas. He began to sing and praise the Lord. And some guy down the hall said, what are you doing? He said, I'm worshiping God. Now, they couldn't see each other. <laughs> he said, well, and he's just singing out, you know, amazing grace. And he just sang. He just sang that song. And the other guy started saying, what is, hey, I know that song. So they started singing with him. And he began, and then he preached. And then he gave an altar call. And he said, are you on your knees? And they said, yes, I'm on my knees. <laughs> ten years went by. Ten years. Ten years. This guy was at a meeting where this man was preaching. And he says, I know that voice. And he went up to him and he said, where were you about ten years ago? Did you by any chance, were you in this jail in this particular city? And he said, did you by chance sing Amazing Grace? And he began to reflect on all those things. And he said, yeah, that was me. Now that guy is out evangelizing around the world. You see, God's plans for you cannot fail. Regardless of the circumstances, his purpose will be accomplished in you. If you'll just let it happen. Just let it happen. When I read in 2 Corinthians about the Apostle Paul's hardships, I see the picture of a revolutionary. I see the picture of what it can mean to serve Jesus. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm not going to read it all, but let me give you, let me put a few word pictures, picture words in your mind. Troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, hard work, sleepless nights, imprisonments, great endurance. Does that paint a wonderful picture? But I see this is a picture of what it can mean to serve Jesus if we're serious. He also says in purity, in understanding, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. It's a powerful thing. Through all of this, Paul kept the faith. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Paul was not alone. Paul was not alone. When he went through these things, he was not alone. He had the Spirit of God with him. Do you know that men put Jesus on that cross? Men hung Jesus on that cross on purpose. Jesus being on that cross fulfilled God's perfect destiny for his life. As painful as it was. He was still there. He was there because of us. You see, God is sovereign over our circumstances. When he spoke, when Pilate spoke to him and he says, Why don't you answer me? Don't you realize I hold the power of life and death in my hand over you? And Jesus responded. He said, it wasn't, If it were not for my Father in heaven... You'd have no position of authority over me. You see, God's in control of our circumstances, no matter, how, no, no matter what they may be. He's there. He's there. In all our trials and all of our temptations, and we talk about mostly the trials and the temptations and the hard times, but in our assignments, He's there. In the job that He gives us to do, He is there. He will be there for us. And in Philippians 4.4, 4, He says, When you are in these... Rejoice in the Lord always. 
192 times. He says, rejoice in your trial and tribulation because you're going through the plan of God and it's okay. Are you willing to do it? Any takers? In 1 Peter 1, 3 through 6, he says this. He says, Praise be to the God of our Father, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. Listen, God's power shields you. If he wants you to live through the bullet or the spear, the spear or the sword, you will live through it. And then you will go on to preach some more. Whatever he's called you to do, he said, I will be with you. He says, in this you greatly rejoice. Not greatly whine. Why me? He says, greatly rejoice. He said, why? So that your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, may be proven. He wants to prove our faith. You have to go through some things to prove your faith. And if you can start here in this school proving your faith here and now, then he can use you out there in greater things to prove your faith out there. I mean, you have to get over some hurdles here and, and win some battles here and gain some, some trust in him here so that when you go out there, then you can have a greater trust for bigger and greater things for God. But you have to go through it here too. If God has planned a revival for your church, if he has planned for salvation for someone in your family to get saved, if a holy revolution is planned by God in this land, and if you are the ones to carry that revolution, then it will come to pass. If that is his ultimate plan, it will come to pass because if that's his destiny, then it will be fulfilled. Regardless of what we see around us, it will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. Let's everyone stand up together. And let's move the chairs. See, I believe that God is sovereign over our individual destiny and our ultimate destiny cannot be modified by Satan. And the sovereignty of God increases our trust in Him. And I know that men cannot stop God's destiny for me or for you and that God is in control of all of our circumstances. But when I... When I think about this, I think about Moses in Exodus 33. And he says, you've been telling me, lead these people. God is telling us, go out and lead these people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. And if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. He says, remember that this nation is your people. God, this nation is your people here. And the Lord replied, my presence will go with you. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us out of here. That's my heart's cry. God, if your presence don't go with me to the places that we need to go, if, it's not, if your presence is not with me when I minister to one, then I don't want to go. I don't want to go. He says, how will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? We need to know that he's going to be with us. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this very thing that you have asked. And I'm asking God. And we are seeing God answer the prayer that, Lord, go with us. Every time I hear or read a missionary testimony from one of our guys out in one of these 16 countries, it proves to me, it validates this word, God is with them because I'm seeing and I'm hearing the impartation value of going out there because God's doing a new thing. He's releasing an anointing into people, into churches that can transform a church in three days. Churches that have been established for years. I want to go and take that presence with me. I need to have the challenge to know that Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. 
and I know he has a plan and a purpose for your life. So I want to have his presence distinguish between me and others as I serve and fulfill that call on my life. I want the world to know there's something different about me. Just this week, the man who's overseeing the housing project where we're building a house, he was having a problem. He says, and he was concerned about his job because, and I'm not going to give you the details, there was just some things, but he was worried. And he's a young man about 35 years old that we've been witnessing to because he said, I want to have a testimony. And I'm thinking, okay, you're going to go through some things. But I didn't tell him that. But this week, he was so disturbed about this thing that was going on with his company. I said, hey, look, John, just don't worry about it. Rejoice in it. And I began to share with him about some things of the Lord and how he could get through this situation. And, he, and, and the simplicity of it was this. I could have just said, well, everything will be all right. Or I could have said nothing. But I began to encourage him in the Lord that, that God has ways of taking care of those who want a testimony, who want to serve him and run after him. God's had, God has ways of taking care of this. And his statement was to me was this. He said, man, he said, I'm so glad that I met with you this afternoon. He says, your confidence in God does something for me. I don't, I don't know how to explain that, but, but just 20 minutes with you has totally turned my week around here. I want the presence of God. We want that challenge to be able to trust God. So this call that I issue to you tonight is a challenge to say, I will trust God. I will trust God. And that, that, that's the challenge that I lay before you because we must get to the place where we say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the call I want you to answer. Are you willing to sign on the dotted line? I'm willing. And we've, you've answered this many times in your own lives, but I know that we continue to ask the question, will I lay my life down? Will, by life or by death, will I be able to go and do what I think God's calling me to do? So this call is a call to say, I will trust you, Lord, if your presence will go with me as I go out, assure me. There's nothing wrong with that. Asking God for that kind of an assurance. Because are, when we pray, are we praying out of fear? Or are we praying out of faith? When we pray, when we're in trouble, when the circumstances seem to be piling up on us, do we say, oh God, my enemy, the devil? Are we praying out of fear? Or are we praying out of faith? Or is our prayer birth out of faith which says, devil, this is far as you go, no more. I take my stand, I take my shield, I take the weapons of God, I take his presence on me. Now you have to get out of my face. How are we praying these days? When we encounter the trials and the circumstances which are very difficult, then we pray, God, I don't like my circumstances anymore. You call me to go to Bible school, but, you know, things are tough here. They want me to learn some things. I have to read my Bible. I have all these books. I don't have enough to eat. I have to work at McDonald's. I was a CEO, man. I mean, you know, come on. God, these circumstances are not as sweet as I thought they were going to be. Or do we pray in faith, which says, hey, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm going to walk. This is a call to trust God. It's a call to take a stand. When you're under persecution, do you pray, oh, God, don't, don't, don't let them take away my rights and my comfort. Or do we pray out in faith and say, I rejoice when men persecute me? Can we do that? Is Bill here? Let's play. I want you to think about this. And I want you to think long and hard about it. Will I trust God? This is a call saying, God, I will trust you. I'm going to lay my life down. I'm willing to go and do what you've called me to do. And again, that you've made this kind of, we've made this kind of call before, but I think God wants to impart something special to you tonight. The idea that he is sovereign over your ministry, over your day-to-day -day life, that even though you go through some difficult times, 
He's there with you. This call tonight is simply to say, Lord, I need to have that understanding and I need to have that presence that I know that I can trust you when I step out for you. I can trust you. If I'm thrown in the lion's den, I expect the angel to be there. I want to trust you like that. When I'm thrown into the deepest prison, if I'm over in a Pakistani jail somewhere when there's no, no one, none of the faculty are out there waiting for me outside, I want to be able to know I can trust you. God, will you give me that assurance? If you're asking and you want that kind of an assurance, then I want you to come down here and just release it to God. I can trust you. Lord, I want to be able to trust you with this kind of lifestyle. As a revolutionary lifestyle, it's going to cost you something. And you have to make that decision. Am I willing to, to write my name in on that line that says, I'm willing to lay down my life for the gospel. I'm willing to lay down my family. I'm willing to lay down this job. I'm willing to lay it down. And it's difficult sometimes to do that. This has been a sobering night. But I wanted it to be an encouraging time for you because I know you're going through things, but I know God said, I will be with you. So let the fear go. Let the doubt go. Release that unto him and say, God, I'm making a, a stand tonight. I will trust you. I will trust you. Tell him, say, I will trust you, Lord. I will trust you, Jesus. shepherd I have no needs you lead me by the peaceful streams and you refresh my life yes Jesus you hold my hand and you guide my steps yes you do Lord yes you do I could walk through the valley of death yeah, tell him you'll walk with him. A
anything that will stop him from being in control. And we know what that three little letter word is. Sin of any kind. That's what will stop the plan and the purpose dead in its tracks. That's the only thing. Not Satan. Not the law of the land. You have to make that choice. This is something we deal with here on a daily basis. But it's something we must deal with on a daily basis. Because I don't want to see that purpose and that plan of God in your life stopped. You're the only one who can stop it, but you are the one who can continue to keep it moving forward. So I want us to pray a prayer, and in your heart, you know, ask the Lord, Jesus, is there anything in me that would stop my trust? Is there fear? Is there doubt? Is there unbelief? Is there sin of any kind that would hinder my call and the continuation of what you've called me to do in this land to be a history maker? To be one who can go out and see and realize that his presence is on me? You see, the disciples, when they went out, people looked at them, and when they were in their presence, they'd say, hey, he's been, they've been with Jesus. That's what we want. People to see that we've been with Jesus. And one of the ways that they can see that we've been with Jesus is we live that holy life. We live that righteous life. You see, one of the greatest things that Jesus did on this earth, he walked on the earth as a man full of the Holy Ghost and without sin said he was tempted just like us, but without sin. And if he can do that, so can we. So can we. I want us to pray together. I want you to pray out loud. Man. Let's everybody around here, let's the whole place pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you. We release to you our sin. And we ask you, take it away. Minister life to me. Wash me in your blood. Protect me by your name, by your word, by your spirit. I need to trust you with every detail of my life. My heart's cry is that I will trust you in every situation. And Jesus, we pray, protect us from sin. Use us in a mighty way. Let us be like Daniel. Let us be willing to be thrown into the lion's den. At whatever the cost, I'll pay the price because you will be there and you'll give the reward back. I don't want to fail you, Jesus. And I know that you will not let me fail. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And we're going to pray for you in just a minute, but we're going to go back into some worship and then we're going to have an announcement unless you want to do that.